Okay, so the, the next few slides are about, well, counters, those calibrated survey meters, so uh, devices that do not make images, but measure radioactivity. Uh, and they matter also for image quantification because often um, the activity determined by some of these devices are used in the quantification of, of PET and even spec images. So, the first one we look at is a well counter. <clears throat> and here, the idea is to have a device that is as sensitive as possible. And the reason is that we want to take, for example, blood samples from a patient, just a small amount of blood, and determine how much radioactivity is in that blood. And that's going to be a very small amount. So we need a, a system with maximum sensitivity. So and this is what it typically looks like. So and this, this little tower here contains a single sodium iodide crystal. Um, and that little hole here gives access to this, this hole in the crystal. And the idea is that you put your sample in here as deep as possible, such that basically it's completely surrounded by sodium iodide. So every photon coming out should travel through that crystal. And because the crystal is pretty thick, it's very likely to produce a scintillation. And then these scintillations are seen by the photon multiplier. And of course, because this thing is extremely sensitive, and because there is just a little bit of radioactivity in here, we need very good shielding, because in the nuclear medicine department, there will be other sources of radioactivity, and we want to avoid any contamination. So, and in addition to that, you can do a background measurement. Um, yeah, here, I think this button says, I think PKG is background. So if you push that, it will do a measurement assuming that there is nothing in the crystal and that everything it measures is background. And then in the next measurement, it can subtract that background radiation. All right. So the one, one thing to consider is that if you put that uh, source a bit less deep, then it is slightly more likely that photons will escape through the hole above here. And that implies that the sensitivity depends on where exactly you put the radioactivity, and therefore even on the amount of water that you use. So suppose that here I would add a bit of water, then the level would go up, the activity would redistribute, and part of the activity would now uh, be more able to emit photons that are not seen. So to just to have an idea about that, we can easily compute uh, the, the effect of the depth on the sensitivity. And that this little drawing is telling how to do that. So we assume that there is a point source here. D is the distance to that hole, H is the diameter of the hole. Um, and then if you do a little bit of calculation, you will find that the sensitivity uh, is equal to this. So in this case, the, the calculations are a bit more involved than I have told previously. So previously, I've often assumed in this case that we can take the area here and divide by the square of the distance. But that becomes less and less true if that D becomes smaller and smaller, because then we need to start taking into account the curvature of, of the uh, surface of the sphere. So if you check in the course, these calculations are pretty simple and they do that more accurately. And actually it's interesting because for a cylindrical PET scanner, if you want to compute the sensitivity, you need exactly the same calculations because it's also a cylinder, it has two holes and the calculations are exactly the same. And so you see if D equals zero, then the sensitivity is a half, which makes sense because half of the photons will be emitted towards the top and they will escape and the other half will be emitted uh, downward and they will get into the crystal. So and if you plot it, then you see that if you put the crystal deep enough, uh, then we're good. But if, if, if you're close to the uh, top, then of course the, the, the sensitivity drops. Okay, and then we have other detectors and they are used to determine the total activity that is going to be injected in the patient. And so there we have a different problem. Now there is in a small volume, a fairly large amount of radioactivity. This will be yeah, like 100 megabecquerel or something like that. So if you would put that in a well counter, it would be completely saturated. It would suffer dramatically from that time because it's too sensitive. So now we want something which is less sensitive. And for that, Haskell detectors are often used. And the principle is pretty simple. So this, this is a container 
uh, for example, the outside is negative and then there is a positive uh, anode in the middle. <clears throat> and inside there is a gas. And then the idea is that uh, a photon, or a KV, for example, comes in and it will travel through the, the gas. There will be photon electron interactions causing ionization. So we have ions and electrons. And the electrons will, of course, uh, travel to the anode and the ions will uh, travel to the cathode. <clears throat> that will produce a measurable current and that current will tell us, uh, give us an idea of the total amount of energy deposited in the gas. Now, suppose you would put no voltage over that detector, then these ionizations will still take place, but the electrons will not move to the anode. They will just hang around a bit and they would recombine with ions and uh, there would be no current, of course. So if I put a bit of voltage, then the electrons will travel slowly through the, to the anode. But while doing that, they may still run into an ion and recombine. So if I put a bit of voltage, then I will see part of the ionizations, but not all of them, because there will be plenty of chance for them to recombine. And the higher I make the voltage, the faster the electrons will move through the anode to the anode and the less likely it becomes that they will uh, recombine with ions. And so if the voltage is sufficiently high, basic, high then basically all electrons will uh, move to the anode, there will be no recombination. And then I measure something which is proportional to the total amount of ionizations. And if I then further increase the voltage, nothing happens. So here we have a, a stable operating point and that is where ionization chambers are used. So that is what is also used in nuclear medicine to determine the dose to be injured. Okay, so if I apply still more voltage, then after a while, the, the output of the system goes up again. And the reason is that with that high voltage, the electrons travel so fast that they will hit other uh, uh, atoms and cause additional ionizations. So you get a kind of avalanche effect where every ionization is creating more uh, ionizations. And as a result of that, the, the output of the system goes up again. And this is called a proportional counter because now the, the, the output of the system is, um, well, here in the ionization chamber, you need typically multiple ionizations to produce a measurable signal, but we're gonna have that because the thing is designed to have lots of activity. In a proportional counter, the system becomes more sensitive. And so a single ionization is enough to produce an output. And that means that the output is then also proportional to the total amount of ionization produced by that particular photon. So you have a measure of the photon energy. So that's why it's called a proportional counter. And if you then increase the voltage further and further, then at the end, you obtain a situation where you really get a maximum output every time. And there, the reason is that the electrons uh, hit the anode with so much energy that ultraviolet photons are released. And these photons travel through the gas and create even more ionizations. So you get a kind of positive feedback. And actually, that needs to be quenched. So tricks need to be applied to, to make sure that after the ionization, the signal uh, uh, gets quenched and, and is turned off again. And so then you have a geiger miller counter. So all it can do is say, yes, I saw a photon. And then if you connect that to a click, it will say click, 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 and then you, you can count uh, it actually. Okay, so that we use it here in the medicine. And so this is what it looks like. It looks a bit like the other system. This thing is a bit larger, of course, because you need more gas than sodium highlight for a measurement like this. And so if you pull this out, then you get a syringe holder like this. You put your syringe in and, uh, and you do the measurement. And again, if that syringe is larger, it, that will have an effect on the, on the measurement. So that's why this thing is sitting here and you're supposed to use always the same syringes to get everything calibrated, uh, standardized such that there is no random variation in, in uh, the output. Um, so as I said, what the thing does um, at this level is just integrating all the ionizations, but they will come from multiple photons. So there is no attempt to do any energy measurement of, I mean, energy of the incoming photon. The only thing that it does is producing something proportional to the total energy released in that gas. 
And therefore, we have, again, to select the isotope. We have to tell the machine it was this isotope. And then uh, after calibration, one can figure out, well, for that isotope, if you see that much uh, ionizations, that corresponds to so much becquerel in the isotope. And so Christoph Pater does a lot of effort to make sure that all the systems in, in our department are nicely calibrated against uh, reference uh, radioactivities to make sure that that calibration is exact. All right. <clears throat> um, and so the, the output is, yeah, is a constant, which, which is function of the isotope, of the, what the isotope emits and the energy of every emission, times the air kerma, and kerma is kinetic energy released in mass. <clears throat> so in, in this case would be argon kerma if the, if the thing was uh, argon film. And so again, the calibration is used to determine these constants. Now, this, this slide is, shown, is, is uh, designed to show that uh, many of the isotopes that we use, they also emit some low energy stuff. We don't care about it. We never get to see it because these, these low energy photons never escape the patient. And if they would, they would not even be detected by the gamma camera. But you see that there's a significant amount of them. And so they will also produce ionizations. So that will affect the um, the output of the system. And that is important as you can see here. So here <coughs> I've done a, a very simplistic attempt to estimate the total attenuation. So this is just a simple model, but it predicts the shape of the curve and the prediction is more or less okay. So first of all, we need um, we want to have photons interact with the gas, but the photons are in the syringe and they need to travel out of that syringe through the water and then through the wall of the syringe to get into the gas. And if the photons have very low energy, like a few uh, kilo electron volts, then there is actually a good chance that they will interact with the water or the, the wall of the syringe and never make it into the gas. So there will be significant attenuation and if the energy is sufficiently low, none of them will escape. So that's the red curve. And as soon as the energy is high enough, then they basically will all escape that syringe and get into the gas. Then once they're in, in the gas, they should interact. And now the curve is the opposite because the attenuation of the gas is much higher for low energy photons than for high energy photons. So uh, PET photons at 511, they, they will have very small interaction chance in, in, in the gas. So this is the attenuation curve of the gas, the black thing. And then if the photon interacts with an electron, then the energy that that photon can produce is proportional to the energy that the photon carried when it was emitted. And so that is this, this uh, blue curve here. And if you multiply these contributions, you get uh, this black curve here. So you get a peak at, at pretty low energies, just high enough to get out of the syringe and low enough to interact heavily with the gas. Then it goes down and then it goes up again because of that blue curve. But this peak is a problem because that means if we use a syringe which is a bit thicker or which has glass instead of plastic, then it will significantly affect that red curve here. And that means that this peak will go up and down depending on what exactly we do with, with that activity or just adding a bit of water could influence this peak. Especially if the ions that we're, uh, if the isotopes that we're looking at have a lot of uh, low energy photon emissions or electron emissions. Um, and for that reason, there is this uh, copper shield. So we, we can apply a, a very thin copper filter just putting that around the syringe. And then the photons need to escape from the, the, the syringe and also get through that copper filter. And the copper filter will stop photons with low energy, but it will have almost no effect on photons with high energy. And as a result, that peak is cut off. So that reduces the sensitivity a bit, but makes the whole thing more stable. If we now make small changes to the tube, that will be, have a negligible effect because the attenuation in the copper dominates over the attenuation in the, in the syringe. Right, and so for, for several isotopes, one always has to use that copper filter. Okay. 
And then there are a lot of uh, different types of handheld devices. Um, and they're needed, for example, if there is a contamination. So, uh, you know, if you walk through the nuclear medicine department, if you get out of it, you, you should uh, put your, go to the monitor and check your hand and feet. And if that monitor says, ah, your left feet is contaminated, then that means that somehow you manage to, to step into some radioactivity. So then people need to figure out where you did that. And with a measure with a, a device like this, one can try to find the source of that radioactivity by uh, yeah, scanning through the department. So there's different types. So for example, this is a ionization detector. It, it has a xenon. And so the, the sensitivity of the thing um, is very dependent on the isotope that, that we're measuring. So again, it, it, it can show you that there is activity. If you want to have an idea how much, you'll have to tell the device what isotope you think is, is being uh, measured. There are more sophisticated ones that use sodium iodide uh, crystals, and they can, in principle, measure the energy of the incoming photon. So they could produce a spectrum. So this, this one doesn't. But uh, the next one, I think this one does. So it has a more sophisticated screen, and that screen can show some spectrum. And then you can see, uh, estimate which isotopes that would be. And for example, stuff like this would be useful for the uh, uh, radio protection department. So we produce a lot of nuclear waste. And uh, we are supposed to sort it, so to put um, different waste baskets for long-lived isotopes and short-lived isotopes. And the reason is that these isotopes need to stay in the hospital until decay is sufficient so that they can be trashed. And before that happens, they're checked. And if then they detect that they're not decaying as expected, then that means that some of us did something wrong and put a long-lived isotope in a short-lived isotope wastebasket. And with devices like this, they can figure out what we have put in and, and what to do with it. Yeah, and uh, it's also called contamination monitor because, of course, again, if, if we detect the contamination, then we have to figure out where that contamination is and what the isotope is. Was. If it's a short lived isotope, they just put a towel and a little paper saying, uh, don't step here. And then the next day, the whole thing can be removed because the isotope is decayed. But if it's a long lived isotope, then the, it needs to be cleaned up, of course. All right, and so here is that monitor that I mentioned. So as you know, if you leave the nuclear medicine department, you should step on this thing and put your hands here. And then the machine will say, don't move. It starts count just for a, a few seconds. And then uh, every now and then it will say, your left hand and your left feet are contaminated. Then you should not panic if it's both at the left. The best thing to do is wait a while, just step on it again, and then it will probably say, no, you're good, no contamination. The reason is that at the left is the nuclear medicine department. And if a patient is being is walking or being uh, uh, driven along here, then the radioactivity in the patient is enough to activate that monitor. So it happens all the time that you have to do another measurement because of that. But if the machine keeps saying that you're contaminated, then you, you need to take that serious. And then there is instructions here what to do. The best thing is to, to fall and not start running around. So especially not if your foot is contaminated. You can take off your shoe and uh, try to clean it. There is cleaning material there. Or even better, you can use the phone to uh, call, for example, the, uh, the chief nurse uh, and, and ask for help or, or phone Christophe. And then he will tell you what to do. So definitely not start running around and looking for help. 